The Commission of Inquiry into State Capture resumed today. Former Public Enterprises Minister Barbara Hogan has testified that some ANC structures were making appointments at state-owned enterprises. Hogan also revealed that the Transnet Board preferred Sipoma Seko as CEO over Siabonga Gama. Gama was ultimately appointed allegedly following political interference. As she also spoke about how former President Jacob Zuma did not protect her. While watching those proceedings was ENCA reporter Aaron Bates, uh, who was out there with Paul Gambi earlier on in the day. Aaron, the one thing that's clear now is that um, in how she detailed her testimony, Barbara Hogan has laid bare the extent to which interference takes place and is, I suppose, in some realm almost even normalized, one doesn't get a sense that whether it is the ANC president, the former ANC president, Jacob Zuma, the ministers that were said to have supported the appointment of Sia Bonga Gama, the members of the tripartite alliance that pressured her, one doesn't get a sense that any of these entities saw anything wrong with how they were behaving. Certainly, and that's something she's raised in terms of what the inquiry should do going forward. She's really asked whether or not a certain uh, body within the ANC that uh, advises on ministerial appointments and on political deployees to the cabinet should still exist in South Africa in this day and age, comparing that with uh, the state of the party and government in the early 1990s. So she really has highlighted the blurred lines between party and state, and also said that at times it seemed to her as though then President Jacob Zuma was acting in a manner that was more befitting of the head of a political party and making uh, assumptions about how people would respond to his instructions on those kinds of grounds rather than what is uh, enforced and uh, should be enforced, I should say, uh, by the Constitution and in law. Uh, but we also then get a sense of how um, members of the executive turn on each other and I suppose uh, inevitably then members of the party and of the tripartite lives turn on, in, in, on each other in terms of trying to fulfill their individual agenda. Speak to us about the campaign that she felt was mounted, not just against her uh, being labelled a racist for uh, supporting Sipo Maseko, but also the public campaign against uh, Sipo Maseko, who she felt was simply unfortunate. Yes, and there she spoke about what it cost him, the kind of uh, discrediting of his own capabilities and capacity as a senior person in business with the requisite skills, experience, and proven um, kind of capacity to lead the group of transnet entities. And uh, she did highlight there that was, what was particularly offensive to her was being alleged to be racist and to be anti-transformation and someone who didn't understand the necessity of transformation in SOEs in South Africa at the time in 2010 and she said that there was this political campaign against her and others allegations of being part of a cabal that were anti-transformation because and she says it was only because there was a due process that had been followed that determined that Maseko was the right candidate because she supported that and not the person that the then president wanted to be hand-picked for the role and who had this cloud over him at the time allegations of misconduct which hadn't been finalized but were certainly there she then faced all of this backlash, and not only from members of the Tripartite Alliance, and there she excluded Kasatu, but also from her colleagues in the ANC, who she thought would think better because they knew her history as a, a political inmate uh, during the struggle, and also then from the press. Very worryingly, she highlighted some of the articles in the press that were backing this narrative about Gama being outruled uh, on political and racial grounds. And, you know, did she speak at all about the impact that this may have had on her uh, personally, how it may have affected her role? She didn't really. I mean, we can remember with Pumla Williams, she really spoke about the personal impact. Uh, we haven't heard that yet from Hogan, but we have heard about her engagements with Zuma and how he was hell-bent on her version during a meeting about the Transnet Group CEO on having Gama appointed and the fact that she says she was not willing to do so. And interestingly, I saw uh, some remarks from a more seasoned journalist that Hogan had a reputation of being quite insistent uh, throughout her history in Cabinet. So, for example... Uh, 
you know, butting heads with the then President Nelson Mandela and storming out of a meeting. So it seems that her character was the kind of person who would hold a line and then feel the heat from a head of state, whether it was Mandela or in this case, Zuma. Let's talk then about her preparations for coming before the inquiry. She spoke about how uh, there was other information that she needed in order to um, back up what she was saying before the inquiry, but that information has apparently gone missing. No, and very worrying there because, you know, it sort of it lines up with some of the other testimony we've heard people, for example, Fakie Mentor, talking about her concerns over security, concerns about a lock to her uh, hotel room and that sort of thing, strange calls. Here we hear about documents Hogan says went missing uh, from the Department of Public Enterprises. Let's just take a look. Minister Gore, I wrote a, an official letter to Minister Gordon requesting access to my documents in order to prepare the statement. I'm sorry, uh, to Minister? Gordon, because he's the Minister of Public Enterprises now. So I requested access to documents in order to prepare. Um, they were able to assist me, and he assigned an advocate in his department to assist me, and I signed off, and they signed off that these were copies. But it was evident that my papers had been quite considerably tampered with. And also we could find no record of my emails. It has seemed that they'd been deleted from uh, my time and maybe a little later from the server of the Department of Public Enterprises. So I did have to reconstruct um, as best as I could some of these um, documents and, and, and my understanding. I spent a lot of time doing that just to make sure that I, you know, that it was solid. Of course, this poses two challenges. One of them is that of um, what could have happened at the Public Enterprises Department that led to the erasure of these documents. But secondly, is an issue of evidence and the credibility now of the evidence that Barbara Hogan will present before the Commission. Of course, and a very legitimate question there about how solid this version of events is, something that's likely to come up if we have any cross-examination. What's important, Cathy, to remember as well is we were on this month-long break. Why why was that? Because the second statement that Hogan submitted named a number of people who needed to be informed that they were mentioned in her longer second statement. And at that time, at the beginning of October, when this was presented and announced before the um, commission, uh, Zuma's own lawyer there said, we thought that things were going to get going at 10 o'clock on the 10th of October, you know, indicating they were ready to roll. And uh, none of Zuma's counsel legal team were present today. He hasn't put up his own version of events. There's nobody who's mentioned in Hogan's second statement who has, subsequent to being notified by the inquiry, announced that they would like to cross-examine her. So it seems that little has actually changed in this last month, except that, you know, we haven't had the hearings in the inquiry. And of course, it's going to be um, quite an interesting week yet. She's back tomorrow to continue giving testimony, but we're also expecting Kevin Gordon there this week. Yes, and he was actually in the audience today, so we had no sign of Zuma or his legal team, but Praveen Gordon and a couple of others there, in fact, you know, a larger audience than I've seen at a couple of hearings, and um, I think telling that he was there and uh, listening to Hogan's testimony, and of course there is this great cloud around Praveen Gordon at the moment. Public protectors due to interview him on Wednesday, and then we're expecting him to testify at the inquiry on Thursday, but of course his statements are already out there in the public domain, and that's something Herb, uh, not Herb and Zondo also mentioned, he sort of said, please, can the public and the press respect the processes of the Commission and not compromise it by leaking information? All right, Erin, let's leave it there for tonight.